right from the dead beginning. Let's go ahead and get this over with so I won't feel bad. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I took a rabbi to Boss Hogs last night. <laughs> he said he was going to start him a messianic church right there by Boss Hogs. He called it Boss Hogs Jesus Church. <laughs> Didn't got good. I've been waiting to, waiting for this day. Uh, uh, it was so funny. He said, uh, uh, he was gonna, or he was going to be preaching it. He says, is that okay? And, I, and of course, it was in Isaiah. And I, I won't get into it. But I just said, is that Old Testament or New Testament? <laughs> okay. God is so good. Our brother flew in from Florida. And he's tired. <laughs> Cold. <laughs> Cold. Look, Florida is not like this, is it? No, I didn't. Well, come on up here, brother. Greg Sabbath, he is our missionary to the Jews in Florida. He's doing a great job. God's blessing him. And God's going to bless him even more. We'll right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, minister to him, Mike, in the name of Jesus. Touch him in everything he says and does today, Lord. Let him, God, be your hand extended. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. And don't forget, we got something to eat afterwards across the street. So there's plenty of food. Whether you brought it or not, go on across the street and get something to eat when we get through here. Well, shalom. Shalom. You guys all know Hebrew. Um, you guys, I wore deodorant. You guys way in the back. I just want to let you guys know. You feel like you had to come up. But, um, you know, I know why the Lord brought me here this weekend. For Bill's Hot Dogs. Did I say that right? Yeah, you got that right. And Boss Hogs. I mean, I would eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That is the best barbecue. But um, I am just a nice Jewish boy that loves Jesus. I have loved Jesus for 27 years. I'm 100% Jewish. I'm 100% Christian, and I get all the holidays off. How about that? Pretty good. I work for Chosen People Ministries, and we're going on 125 years. We have interesting how we started. There was a rabbi named Leopold Cohen. And you know what? You don't get any more Jewish than the name Cohen. And uh, he was starting to read the scriptures, and you start to realize that maybe the Messiah must have come, because he was reading some prophecies that said the Messiah would die before the second temple was destroyed. So one of his friends, he was searching all around Rabbi Cohen, and one of his friends, I, I think he might have been kidding, when he said, go to New York. You know, leave hungry, go to New York. You know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. So this guy gets on a three-week boat trip. Rabbi Leopold Cohen barely speaks English at all. And he's walking on a Sunday afternoon in the Holy Land, and that's Brooklyn. And he looks to the right, and he sees a Jewish star on a building. He goes in, and he doesn't understand English, but it was a service in Yiddish. So this rabbi gets radically saved, starts preaching the gospel, and 125 years later, we're still here. So, anyways, and I've had some interesting, I was reading on the plane, uh, some interesting things about Jesus. Did you know that none of, that Jesus was not allowed into any of the jewelry stores in Jerusalem? Did you know that? Because the jewelers were afraid he would break all the chains. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Alright, well there's another interesting thing. Though. They found the Apostle Paul's house over the weekend, an archaeological dig. They found a lot of tiles, mostly Gentiles. <laughs> oh man, that's it. Those are the followers. <laughs> see, see why Pastor Dave and I get along so well? <laughs> that's what he likes me about. Anyways, I'm going to share with you a message which I call Isaiah 53, the most dangerous chapter in the Bible. Before I do that, I'm going to call up one of my favorite people in Edwards, and Marina. She's going to read Isaiah 53. And Marina, I have proof that she loves me. She put a Facebook post that said, Greg Savin, one of my favorite people are coming to town, you know. So I blew that up and put, it, put a big picture on it. But anyways, uh, and this afternoon, if you're interested, we're doing a Jewish, uh, Jewish Christian uh, baby dedication. So it's something that you'll never seen before. It'll be really interesting. So she's going to read Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, 
and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. As we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He, prolong, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his land. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteousness servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with his transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you. I picked a good teacher's voice, didn't I? Look at that. No microphone. She projected. Yeah. You know, the rabbis wish that Isaiah 53, what Marina just read in the Old Testament, they wish that Isaiah had gone to bed early that night because this is a very dangerous task to them. In fact, I've been in Jewish ministry for 21 years, and I love to just read them Isaiah 53, and I don't tell them where it's from. And at the end of the chapter, you know, 90% of the Jew times these Jewish people said, yeah, that's that gospel of John. You know what? You know, that's the New Testament stuff. Or is that the book of Revelation? Or is that Paul? And I'm like, no. That is Isaiah 53, written 750 years before Jesus was born, 2,600 years ago. And what's amazing is that, uh, you know, Jewish people have never heard this because, you're not going to believe this, Isaiah 53 is never, ever, ever read in the synagogue. They read in the Haftarah, the prophet sections on a Friday, they'll read Isaiah 51 one week, they'll read Isaiah 52 verse, to verse 12, and the next week, whoops, let's go to Isaiah 54. Why do they do that? In fact, Jewish people have a holiday called, uh, called um, Simchat Torah, where they say they've read the whole Bible in a year, but they, read, they really haven't. They skip the chapter, so... Why did they skip the chapter? Well, I used to live in central Illinois called Bloomington, Illinois, and the only, only temple they had there was Moses Montefiore. And I didn't know that Moses Montefiore was a famous rabbi. And he was once asked, why do they not read Isaiah 53? And listen to what he says. Because of the Christological, or Christological interpretation given by the chapters... We've left it out because it sounds too much like the Savior, Jesus. Wait a second. The, one, of this, one of the founding great rabbis of this country saying, we don't read Isaiah 53 because it sounds too much like Jesus. Well, in the words of Ronald Reagan, sorry to get political, if it looks like a duck, if it acts like a duck, if it flies like a duck, it's a duck. That's right. I mean, could you imagine if... If uh, Pastor David said, I'm sorry, we can't read anything in the New Testament. It sounds too Jewish. I mean, that would be crazy. But um, it's interesting that, you know, every book in the Bible is written by someone who is Jewish. 
So every book of the Bible is, you think, is going to be about the Word, which is Jesus. Now, some of you think, well, maybe Luke wrote uh, Luke and Acts. But the way I look at it, he was a doctor. So being a doctor, I think he's a good chance he might be Jewish. Now, you would get that joke if you were in Miami, Florida. But you don't get it in Edward, North Carolina. A lot of Jewish people are doctors. So anyways, um, this is really interesting. If you look at Isaiah 53, let's pretend we're not believers in Jesus, okay? You read Isaiah 53, and just be an open mind. This afternoon, just read it. Pretend like you don't believe in anything. I don't know how anybody can read that chapter and not come to believe that Jesus is the suffering servant in that chapter, which was, was prophesied 750 years before he was even born. Now, I want to tell you another Jewish holiday. You guys ever heard of Day of Atonement? Yom Kippur? It's the Christmas and Easter rolled into one for Jewish people. We're all at synagogue. That's the day our name is going to be written on the book of life. I mean, that's serious stuff for Jewish people. I know atheists that go on Yom Kippur. Why? Because they're hedging their bet. Maybe God's wrong. You know, maybe they're wrong. So they go all day to synagogue. But listen to what was in the liturgy less than 100 years ago on the most important day of Yom Kippur. And tell me if this sounds like something maybe you just heard. He hath borne the yoke of our iniquities, and our transgression is wounded because of him. He bears our sins on the shoulder. We shall be healed by his wound at a time when the eternal one, the Messiah, as a new creature. So... In, a, in the holy, holy days, Yom Kippur, Jewish people are reading liturgy. And the liturgy says, God is the one that creates the Messiah. He is wounded because of our transgression. And the Messiah bears his sins on our shoulder. And that's less than 100 years ago. Can I get an amen? Because I think that's pretty cool stuff. Um, so sometimes I wonder how Jewish people missed it. And to understand why they missed it, i got to teach you about the Jewish oral law. You guys are so glad that you're not Jewish. You, we have one book to figure out. I can't even figure out this book. The Bible, you know, 66 books. Jewish people picture an entire set of Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the Jewish oral law. That's Jewish rabbis for thousands of years, what they believe about the scripture. And what happens is, you know that oral law? which is now written in the Talmud, that's equal to the scripture. Now, if I came out this morning and I said, I have the NIV Zondervan commentary. This is the word of God. You would say, Greg, you're Meshuggah, you're nuts, you're crazy. That's not the word of God. That's just a commentary. Jewish people believe that this commentary is equal to God's word. So when I read you this Jewish context of, of the oral law, rabbis, Jewish people believe this is equal to the law. Now this was 200 years after the, the death of Jesus. This is by Rabbi Ben Uzil. Listen to what this guy says in the Talmud, which is inspired. It said, they're talking about Isaiah 53, he says, the God's anointed one here is the Messiah. Whoa. Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. He shall be high increased and be exceedingly strong as the house of Israel. There's another one in, in the Talmud. They said, what is the, my, Isaiah's name, the Messiah's name? The rabbi said his name is Leper Scholar. Because surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God, and afflicted. Does that sound familiar? Well, it's from right off of Isaiah 53, verse 4. He bore our sins and our sorrows, and he carried them. Yet he himself was stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. Now, I'm going to take you to a Jewish book that you probably never heard of. Have you ever heard of the Zohar? Now, the Zohar is the meta-narrative of Kabbalistic Judaism. What's a meta-narrative? Our meta-narrative is the Bible. Their metadiff is the Zohar. And there's a lot of people that you know are following this religion, but you probably didn't know it. There's such great biblical scholars as Madonna 
Ashton Kutcher, Britney Spears, Demi Moore, Lindsay Lohan, Rosanna Barr, they're all believing in the Kabbalah, which is this Jewish mysticism. They also they have the red bands on them. If you ever see a red cord in them, that means they're the Kabbalah. But I bring this up because that is a legitimate branch of Judaism. And here's what they said in the Zohar. They said, the palace the Messiah enters, and he summons every pain and every chastisement of Israel. All these come and rest upon him. There have been no man able to bear Israel's chastisement for the transgression of law as written. Surely our sicknesses he has carried. So in the Kabbalah, mystical Judaism says there is a Messiah that will take away the pain of Israel, will bear the transgression of law, and he carried our sickness. Now, you might be wondering, why don't Jewish people today, why don't they believe in Isaiah 53? I mean, all the rabbis before then believed he was a suffering servant who died for sin. Why don't they believe? Well, there's a rabbi in the 1100s called Rashi. Great, brilliant rabbi. He was like the great commentary time. He said, no, 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 no. Isaiah 53, it's not about the Messiah. It's not about the suffering servant. It's not about the sins of the world on this one person. No, no. It's about Israel. Israel is all about this person in the chapter. Well, first of all, this doesn't work for many reasons. Number one, number one you know those writings I just read to you in the Talmud? If those are inspired, then they have to be true, correct? So if these rabbis say that this is the Messiah who's taken our sin and our chastisement, Rashi can't just change it. It's kind of like, you know, the Supreme Court, they have to go by legal precedence in the past. You can't just change it. Secondly, he says it's about Israel. Now, if you read Isaiah 53, you're going to see he, him, he, him, he was led to slaughter, he was despised, rejected, he was pierced for our transgressions. There are 41 first-person pronouns. Now, if it was Israel, it would have they or something of a plurality. Also, what's interesting to note is that the rabbis who believe that it's Israel, they've got a Houston, we got a big problem on this one part. It's verse 8. Um, it says, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of our descendants? For he was cut off for the land of the living. Guys, if this is Israel, Israel's dead. When has Israel ever been dead in the scriptures? They might have been dormant for 2,000 years, but they never died. In fact, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Jeremiah 31, 36. It says, only if these decrees, the sun to shine by day, the moon and stars by night, vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will descendants of Israel ever cease to be before me. Guys, when we have no sun, we have no stars, and we have no moon, that's when we'll have no Israel. So when Isaiah 53 says this person was cut off from the land of the living, that just is, must, must, must not be true. Finally, Verse 9, they say, uh, they say, this person has done no deceit, nor has any deceit in his mouth. They make Israel be like this wonderful, godly servant who's dying for the sins of the world. Has anybody ever read the book of Isaiah? I challenge you to read just the first chapter. Do you think you're going to see a godly, holy, innocent nation that's dying for the Jews and Gentiles? No way. First chapter, first verse says, God says you've rebelled against me. Second verse, the ox knows its man, master, the, da the donkey its, its, its owner, but Israel does not know. Fourth, fourth verse, Israel is a brood of evildoers, children of the corruption. They've forsaken the Holy One Israel. Verse 10, Israel is equated to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not a good picture here, guys. And verse 14, God says, all you offerings are meaningless. So the whole book of Isaiah is Israel rebellion. And all of a sudden, Isaiah 53, Israel is an innocent lamb that's led to the slaughter. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Do you agree? Or am I Meshuggah? I think I'm right on here. 
I think there's no way that this could be Israel. So, I want to talk to you about Isaiah 53. We've got to answer some questions here. First of all, who's the subject of Isaiah 53? And why is this person totally blameless? In verse 7, he was afflicted and pressed, yet he did not open his mouth. He was a lamb led to the slaughter, and a sheep before a share of silence, so he did not even open up his mouth. You know where I can see how this lamb is spotless and innocent? I'm going to take you to Passover. You guys probably never noticed this. If you read Exodus chapter 12, you know when they, when they sacrificed that one-year-old lamb on the night of Passover? We just, you guys probably just think they got the lamb and they sacrificed it. But if you read the scriptures, on the 10th of the sun, the 10th of the sun, they take and select that one lamb. And the reason they do that is for four days, they want to make sure that that lamb was without spot, without blemish, without disease, and it was undefiled. So they inspected that lamb so that it was wholly perfect, and then it could be sacrificed. So it's interesting that this Jesus is the perfect lamb. Also, Israel could not have died for the world because, tell me where the Bible where Israel ever died for the Gentiles. You know, Jesus in one of the Gospels, you know, he says, you know, one of them, he says, you know, you're like a dog. And the, and the woman says, well, even the dog gets some crumbs. I mean, that's how Jewish people feel, felt about Gentiles. It was really separate and they were, they were an unholy group. Uh, this is not a joke. This is true archaeological discovery here. They found a plaque a year or two ago in the front of the temple and it was, it was the court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, you could go in the court of the temple, but it says, if you go further in the temple, you will face death. So there was a separation between Jews and Gentiles. So, um, who is causing this? And what happened to this person? It said, verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by God, and afflicted. So this person... He, did you notice he, singular person, is be afflicted by God, stricken and afflicted. He took up our pain and suffering. And I want to explain a little bit. Um, recently, a couple years ago, my dad was a doctor, and he always uh, got this New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, I don't know why, but somebody, I, I saw this on the Internet, the New England Journal of Medicine, which is like the New York Times of medical journals, talked about crucifixion. And I just want to take a moment to talk about what Jesus went through. Because the first thing you have to know is when he got spikes in his arms, he shattered the medium nerve, which was one of the most sensitive nerves of the body, which means shouts of pain would be going from his wrist to his brain constantly. First thing he did on the cross was he dislocated his shoulder. My God, I've had bursitis one, one, for a couple months. I was the biggest baby wimp in the world. I couldn't do anything. I can't sleep. I can't do anything. My shoulder hurts. He got both his shoulders dislocated. Uh, oh, let's not forget to mention that his back, which was stuck against the wood across, was whipped so hard with a, with a whip and a bone, literally splitting open his back. He's on the back of this. Now, what happens is when you're in crucifixion, you cannot exhale. And when you're not exhaling, that's poison, carbon dioxide. And your heart beats up to 250 times a minute to get that out. And what would happen is you could barely breathe, you pass out, and then just before you keep your body's in serious trouble, your whole body would just jerk up and you would take a breath and you'd fall back down. And when you're pushing up, you're pushing up where your feet has been put with spikes. This is a horrible death. So how was this person punished? He was pierced for our transgressions. Pierced for our transgressions? That sounds like crucifixion, don't you think? <coughs> crucifixion has not been invented for the, was not been invented for at least another 400 years. Isn't that pretty interesting? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was cut, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And I love this, by his stripes we are healed. Because I always think of when Jesus was whipped, 
that they would have split up in his back, that they would have left stripes, his muscles and his, his blood vessels would have been popping out, and by his strife, we are healed. Um, why is this person punished for our transgressions? Well, this person is getting pierced, crushed, and we get peace. <clears throat> we get peace from his transgression. Um, why is God doing this to this person in Isaiah 53? It's for you and I. God, his son, to whom we deserve. And we think about that, yeah, Jesus paid for our penalty. But I mean, think about this. Just really think about it. He that was without sin became sin so that the righteousness of God is in us through him. I mean, we, we sometimes get rope, but you know what? He gave us his righteousness. Our sins are forgiven past, present, future, but the righteousness in Christ is on him. Verse 6, it said, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, of us all, past, present, and future. Um, verse 7, I think it's always amazing. How did this person handle this punishment? He said he was led to the land of slaughter as a sheep, its shares are silent, and so he did not even open his mouth. He was led like a lamb in the slaughter, as a sheep before its shares is silence, so he did not open his mouth. Do you want to know what Greg Savitt would have done? I would be making a plea deal. <laughs> oh, you know what? When I said destroy the temple, I didn't really mean, oh, no, no you got it wrong. No, I didn't mean that. I mean, I mean he's amazing how... He could have called down angels, he could have got out of this, but he, he was pierced, stricken, and whipped. So what happens to this person? In verse 8, it said, he was cut off to the land of living. That sounds to me like he's dead. Would you agree? Yeah, he's dead. And then it says in verse 9, this is pretty cool, watch this. He was assigned a grave with the wicked but with the rich in his death. Now, how can that be? Jesus was put to the people on the cross. They were, they were criminals. But when Jesus was, who died, Joseph of Arathema, extremely wealthy Jewish man, put his body into his tomb, which was a, for the rich people. So that was fulfilled. That is pretty cool. Usually they would just put the body in a gigantic dump heap. So anyways... I want to share a couple more things in Isaiah 52. You might be saying, well, what, why did, why, why not, you know, why are you doing Isaiah 52? Well, you know, so, some people believe that I, Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, through Isaiah 53, is the start of the Messianic prophecy. And Jewish people only read up to Isaiah 52, 12, so I think they agree with me. Um, I want to read this. It says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. That's my type of Messiah. Yes. I want him raised. I want him wise. I want him highly exalted. And back then in the time of Jesus, they wanted somebody to take over the Romans, kick him out, become king of Israel, and all the Jews would come in there. But Jesus didn't want that. And verse 14 kind of threw me as a new Jewish believer. Just as their many were appalling, his appearance was so disfigured that that of any human being is formed, marred before any human likeness. Now, okay, I got the servant. He's highly exalted. He's famous. You know, I even understand Jesus fulfilling this on Palm Sunday. He's riding in on a donkey, and they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord and the, the King of Israel. And four days later, they're screaming to crucify him. But... What I did not get was, how could Jesus' face be so marred beyond anything in the scripture? I thought, surely somebody could have been beat up more than Jesus, or in a fire, or something like that. And the Lord really showed me something early on as a Jewish believer, that Jesus took up our sickness. If he took our sickness... On the cross, he took up our influenza, our chicken pox, our measles, our Ebola, 
our leprosy, our influenza, the bubonic plague. He took it on the cross. And that's why I really believe his face was so disfigured beyond anything. Because he took every one of our illnesses. Um, Isaiah 53 verse 2. Don't we all want to know what Jesus looks like? I mean, I do. I want to see what he, you know, what did he really look like? I know we have a lot of different paintings, but um, in first Isaiah 53, verse 2, it said, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing as in his appearance that we should desire him. So Jesus wasn't ugly. He just wasn't Tom Cruise, you know, or Tom Selleck, uh, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, whatever you want. He was just a plain person. And you know what? That makes sense because people were drawn to his soul, his spirit, what he said, not if he was good looking. But funny, when I was growing up, I thought Jesus looked like Al Pacino because all my friends were Italian, Catholics. Every time I went to their home, they had, you know, Serpico, you know, Al Pacino on the wall. But, um, I've gone a lot of traveling in my missionary days in 21 years. I've gone to churches. They have a black Jesus. You know, that's what they believe in. And I've gone to a Chinese church with a Jesus that looks like Buddha. I mean, it's interesting. But I have to say, the most interesting one was I went to a Jamaican church. Did you know that Jesus had dreadlocks? I didn't know that. But according to Jesus, it was dark and he had dreadlocks. But anyways, I'm going to switch gears and now and we're going to go to something I don't know if you ever knew, but here in Isaiah 53 is the resurrection. The most important part of our faith. If the tomb is not empty, we should have slept in this morning. But because he lives, we can see tomorrow. So, Isaiah 53.10, um, it said, It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord make his life an offering for sin. Now we know he's dead, right? Because he's cut off from the land of the living. He's buried with the rich and the poor. So he's dead. But then it says, he will see his offspring. Now wait a second. How's this dead guy going to see his offspring? Guess what? You. We are his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So how is this person who's dead, who's buried, who's in a tomb, how is he seeing, how is he prolonging us and giving us, us our destiny and he'll see our offspring? It's really easy. He rose from the dead. The tomb is empty. The death has no victory. Because he live, we have hope for tomorrow. He is the eternal son of God. And because he rose from the dead, his spirit is in us and we will live forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 11, it gets better. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. You guys just pass over that and said, oh, light of life. In Hebrew, that means he's resurrected. That's a term for resurrection. So it says, he will be resurrection, resurrected and will be satisfied by the knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Justify many. That's my favorite word, justification. It's a legal declaration of not guilty. Your sins are forgiven, past, present, future, and Jesus is going to justify us. Hallelujah. Right here in Isaiah. Um, what's interesting is we see this in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace through God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Jesus has been risen from the dead, and he has given us offspring, and he will justify us, uh, many. And I love this in verse 11. I don't know if I, if I touched on this. I don't think it says, he will justify many. Guys, that's future tense. 750 years ago, before Jesus was born, Isaiah is saying, this person who died, who has cut off from the land of living, he is going to be the light of life. He is resurrected, and he is going to justify the world. So, um, I think that's pretty, don't you think that's pretty good news yes. right here in the gospel? Yes. 
A uh, couple quick things about Isaiah 53 in, in the New Testament. Do you remember Acts chapter 8? You have Philip, and he's in the ministry in Samaria, and God brings him to a desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he meets an Ethiopian eunuch. Do you remember this story? And this eunuch is in charge of treasury. He'd gone to Jerusalem to worship. He was one of those righteous, godly Gentiles. And then on his, home, on his way home, he's reading the book of Isaiah. And he's a God-fearing Gentile, Gentile. He must be wealthy. And Philip runs up to the chariot. And Phil and, and, and the Ethiopian says, do you understand that? And he says, this is the passage the scripture was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and his lambs before a chair is silent. So he did not open his mouth in his humiliation. He is deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For him, life was taken from the earth. Eunuch asked, is I, what is this Isaiah talking about? And it says that Philip starts sharing the gospel. Then he gets baptized. So he hears Isaiah 53. Then he gets baptized. Jesus in Matthew 8, verse 17, says, This was the fill that was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Now, do you remember Luke 24? Jesus has just been, been, been crucified, and these two guys are walking to Emmaus, and this other guy, they don't know who he is, and uh, you know, they tell him that Jesus just died. How come we don't know it? And then Jesus said, beginning with the prophets and the writings, he began to tell everything about himself. So Jesus, on a seven-mile walk to Emmaus, are talking to these two guys, and I guarantee you, you know how they have the poker games, you know, they're like, I'm all in. You see that on the James Bond movies, I'm all in. Put all your chips in the middle. I'm all in that Jesus would have talked about Isaiah 53, because it's the most poor chapter in the Bible. So, what about Isaiah 53? Um, there's a lot of different examples of some people who've come to know the Lord in my ministry. Uh, one was a man named Lloyd Orlow, and he, I had a meeting with him, and I talked about uh, the Bible and Isaiah 53, and he, like, left, and I never heard from him. Five years later, his sister told me that he came to faith in Jesus. And I said, that's strange, because he was really an argumentative guy. He said, well, he took the Bible and kept reading the Isaiah 53, and he couldn't get it out of his head, and he finally came to realize that Jesus was the promised Messiah of Israel. So that's pretty amazing. Also, there was, was Aaliyah. She was a millennial from Israel, and I was witnessing to her, and I said, I want you to go home and read Isaiah 53, and she went home, and she realized she didn't have a Bible. So she got her dad's Bible, and when she opened up her father's Bible on Isaiah 53, in her dad's handwriting was this sounds like the Messiah. So later on, she told her dad, Dad, I, 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 got, I have to talk to you. I got some serious news. And he, was, he didn't know what was wrong. He said, what's wrong? She's like, well, I think Jesus is the Messiah. He says, oh, yeah. I came to that conclusion about two years ago from reading Isaiah 53. So also, um, we have a book um, called Isaiah 53. I brought some of them with me. Um, this is a great book about Isaiah 53. And um, one of the people that ordered this on Facebook, his name was Dr. Levi. And he was one of those Jews that believed in Kabbalah, you know. And then he was like, you know, God is light. And I could say, yeah, he is light. Jesus is light of the world. And he would try to trump me. He'd like, well, you know, God comes with ten different sephirot, or ten different manifestations of God, like crown and wisdom and understanding and kindness, strength, beauty, awe, foundation, monarchy. And I just said, really, Dr. Levi? Jesus is the Word made flesh. And He came upon us. And He is God. And He has all these attributes. He didn't have a good answer for that. So, uh, basically what I'm doing in Fort Lauderdale, I'm in charge of all the United States fellow. And I have a huge job, and I hope that you pray for me. Uh, with this book, and the petitions that we put on Facebook, would you believe that we got 10,000 names of Jewish people that want to know about Jesus. I mean, that's like red meat to me, but I can't do it all, so I'm working all around the country, and I've recruited like 
uh, 70 different volunteers that I'm training. So that's a lot what I'm doing is reaching Jewish people with the gospel um, from Isaiah 53. Um, I just want to thank you guys for uh, listening to my bad jokes, but I have a real history with this church. Um, I've been coming here for, I think, 18 or 19 years, and uh, I love you guys, and um, I'm amazing that this small church in the middle of nowhere loves the Jewish people and support me, and um, you, guys did, you guys did one thing that really blessed my kids' hearts, and I want to share with you. One Christmas, we like took a, um, you just filled up a big a UPS priority envelope. And you put a note in, these are the kids. And you crumpled up dollar bills and five dollar bills and ten dollar bills. And my kids were like, how could somebody do this for us? They don't even know us. And it was just such a blessing. And you can do that again this year for me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm really, I, I stand before the Lord. They were like, why would these people who don't know us bless us like this? And I had, it was a great opportunity to say, you know what, we're, we're all Christians, and they believe in what we're doing, and so it's really a blessing. So, I wanted to let you know about this, and also I have another great book written by a new author, Greg Savitt. This is my bucket list. It's called From, for, from Tradition to Eternity, you know, like From Here to Eternity. You know, I don't think the millennials get this, but older people do. Uh, this is my testimony, my 21 years of evangelic stories. Uh, messianic prophecies and stuff, and if you really get it. And I'll sign it if you buy it, and if I become famous someday, I, you can put it out on eBay, and you can make a lot of money, so who knows. But um, anyways, I want to ask you to take out your cards that you got. What we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to rip this on the counter for you. Remember Rabbi Leopold Cohen? He said, 125 years ago, he said, if any congregation wraps a... a Rips this on exactly the count of three. This will usher in the second coming of the Messiah. No pressure whatsoever. But we're going to rip this on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, maybe this is why I have to come back year after year. I don't know. Hey, if you guys want to get my newsletter, I really hope that you just fill this out. It's free. Um, you get my prayer letter, things that I'm dealing with, certain prayer requests. Uh, I'll let you know about my my kids and, you know, praying for my son. He's uh, in the University of Tel Aviv getting his uh, master's in Jewish studies. And um, he's like, this is the best thing about him going to Israel. I'm not kidding you. One day we're talking about Judaism and, and rabbinical stuff. He goes... Dad, you really know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I guess all the money I'm giving him is paying off. But anyways, uh, you'll find, we'll tell you about you know, some of the people that I'm ministering to and the churches that I'm going to and the events we're going to. Uh, so that's that. And you also get a free book about the, 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 what's happening uh, with our ministry, Leopold Cohen. So I, I'm basically witnessing to Jewish people about Jesus I do this one-on-one -on -one in Starbucks. I have a Bible study that I go to. I have different fellowships. I get names of people all the time off of Facebook uh, that I call. And uh, sometimes I meet them in church. I just want to tell you this one story. I just, it's so amazing. I woke up on a Wednesday morning and something wasn't right. I was so anxious. And I didn't even have my coffee yet. So I was kind of freaking out. What's the problem? And I went to this church, there's like 400 people, and I was doing the Passover, was signing the Passover, and I really wasn't worried because I had preached in front of those, you know, those many people before, but guys, I walked out on the stage, and literally, I'm not kidding you, my mind went blank, like I knew nothing about Passover. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I just said, dear Jesus, help me. And what happened is, okay, I saw an element, I saw a cup, I started talking. It was the worst time, worst presentation I had ever given. I was so embarrassed. And the pastor starts running at me. I'm like, ay vey, you know, what's he going to say? I'm going to be fired, you know. He goes, did you know that eight people came to receive the Lord? I'm like, are you sure about that? <laughs> and then I went to my book table like I have out there, and this Jewish kid says, this is my card. I'm not a believer in Jesus. Call me. 
guys, that never happens. I gotta track these people down by email and text and phone calls. So we meet, and we meet in, a, in ground zero of, of Judaism in Florida, which is Boca Raton. So see, so you learn ground zero is Boca. So I met with this guy and um, met with him for months, and finally I said, you know, why don't you receive this book and read this? And he comes back the next week, he's like, you know what, there is no temple, there is no way that Judaism can exist. Jesus fulfilled that, and he prayed to receive the Lord with me right in Starbucks about Raton. But it gets interesting, because then he said, oh, and I found a nice Christian girl, I'm getting married. I'll fly to Chicago to do the wedding. I'm like, that's great, you know, what's it going to be like? He's like, piece of cake, all Christians, no problem. So I go there, and I'm about to do the service, and I see Muslims are walking in. I see Orthodox Jews. I see kids in dreadlocks. I see people that are obviously, and I'm like, I'm going to kill this kid. But I just shared the message with my heart, and it was the Holy Spirit fell because I had atheists talking to me. I had Muslims. I had Orthodox Jews. And you know what the millennial kids started to call me? Rabster. Half rabbi, half pastor. So all night they're like, hey, Rabster, I got a question for you. So it was really beautiful what happened. But anyways, uh, go ahead, fill that card out. If you feel led, like if you'd like to give a gift, you can make a check. Uh, if you'd like to give out a mount, um, you can fill it out and put cash. And if you'd like to fill it out as a debit card, you can. And if you'd like to stand with me monthly, that would be a blessing. And if you ever get the envelope in the mail and you feel led like you want to give to Jewish people, um, I, will use your, I will need your support in South Florida. There are 750,000 Jewish people in South Florida. I live in the second largest Jewish population in the United States. Guys, I can't prove this, but I'm pretty sure Jesus was facing towards Miami when he said the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. I can't prove it, but I think there's a really good chance. But anyways, oh, God bless you guys, and uh, thank you for putting up with my bad jokes. But I got a feeling like, you know, I'm sure you fed up with the pastors. So. <laughs> I don't feel so bad. But anyways, God bless you guys. Thank you. I never tell a dry, I never tell a dry joke. <laughs> 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 Feels great, that boy. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad that Greg came and shared with us. Greg, that was awesome. I want everybody to stand. Now, don't, don't forget now, when you get ready to leave, once you go back there, there's a, uh, there's a table back there with books on it. You go get a book there, and we'll try to move the table over to the fellowship hall. Uh, if somebody will help take it to the fellowship hall, some of those guys are. are Either the table or just take the stuff to the, to the fellowship hall and put it on the table in the fellowship hall. You ain't got to carry the whole table. But um, help them carry the stuff over there so people can get to it there. Uh, it's very interesting to to spend some time with somebody that, is, that has a different kind of background than you have. Have you ever done that period? You said you were somebody that's had a total different background. Like, like last night, I was amazed listening to him talk and he was amazed that I eat stuff like at Boss Hogs all the time. He said, you mean you grew up on this stuff? I said, I grew up on this stuff. He said, wow, you lived in heaven. <laughs> Amen. So, so, so again, it's, it's good to get to talk to people that were raised different so you can learn some things. And, and, and Greg's got a lot of stories. And Greg uh, has been around. Amen. He, he's, got, he's got all his, uh, he got, he's got a lot of stories on his miles. Amen. He got, he got some good stuff in there. Amen. I want everybody right now, uh, don't forget, go back and look at the books, and then we're going to go over and eat. So we got food over there, go over there and eat, and talk with him over there too. But he talked about, he was bruised for our nickel, he's chastised a little piece of the pine. I, I, I want everybody to bow your heads. Just everybody bow your heads. DC, come here and play something, son. I don't want to leave this place without a chance for anybody to be prayed for. Especially if they don't want Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You know, I keep coming to people and they say, How? You know, they don't even ask me, How is Bethany doing? And I say, Bethany's doing better than any of us right now. She's gone on to be with God.
and then without a, without a, without a flinch, they're asking, well, how are you doing? And I gave you, you know what? If I didn't believe in Jesus and did not believe that that heaven it was a better place, I'd be having a lot rougher time tomorrow than heaven. Just having a separation from her when I know that it was, that's only for temporary because I will see her again. But just knowing that Jesus has got this changes the whole situation. Every head bowed, every eye closed. First off, if you're just having one of those situations right now that you're in, you just need Jesus to intervene, to show himself strong, to, to step forward in your life and to do something different, to bring you peace. But nobody looking around, every eye closed, but just raise that hand. I, 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 need, I really need the touch from God today. I'm, I'm needing some peace. I'm needing God to do something special for me. Right now, in the name of Jesus, bless them, Lord. Bless every hand that was raised, those that wanted to raise them, didn't. I ask you, Lord, to bless them right now. Let them feel your peace. Let them feel your anointing. Let them feel your touch in the name of Jesus. We know, God, that you've got this. Maybe you're here this day, and you know Jesus, but you're not where you used to be. Matter of fact, you're a long way from where you used to be. We used to run free in the fields of the Lord. Now you feel like you're running from the Lord all the time, and you're needing God to just refresh your spirit and to, to make it new inside of you all over again. A fresh touch and a fresh anointing. I'm talking to you every head bowed, every eye closed. You're saying, I just, I, I'm not where I was and I, I really need God to, to, to bolster me and to let me see Him in a real way and to, to feel His touch. But I'm talking to you. Would you just raise that hand quickly? Just raise it up and say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus to do it all over again. Lord, do it all over again in these people, Lord. Follow them through your power and your anointing. Let them see your hand. Let them see your, feel your spirit. Let them know, God, that you've got them. And finally, maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't know him as your personal Savior. But you want to. You feel the need. Don't leave this place without asking Jesus in your heart. If there's anybody here where every head's bowed, every eye's closed, you would say, I need Jesus in my heart. Would you raise up that hand? Just put it up there quickly. Here's what we're going to do. I just feel so... I feel so uh, touched in my heart to do this. Let's just do this. I want everybody... We're going to pray a prayer of rededication right now. When I think about what Jesus did for us, when I think about the scars, when I think about the, the, the pain, when I think about dislocating his shoulders and his hips, and all the things that did on that cross to him, and how he actually uh, drowned on that cross in the dryness, he drowned. And I, I, I just can't even imagine the pain. And then to think about his mother at his side watching all of this. Wow. When I think about all of this, it makes me want to draw closer and closer to Him. We're all going to pray together a prayer of rededication right now. Every last one of us, repeat after me. Father, I come to You with open hands. I trust You to do something new in my life. I lift up my hands for You to use. I lift up my heart for you to control. I lift up my spirit for you to take. Father, I'm yours. I rededicate my life to you today. I'm ready to see you move in a different way, in a powerful way in my life. And I thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for it. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Now, don't forget, I'm going to go ahead and say the prayer right now, or our blessing, so we can go ahead and go over here and just start eating. You ain't got to wait for somebody to say the blessing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in your house. I ask you, Lord, as we go over there to bless the fellowship and bless the food that nourish our bodies. And Lord, bless Greg. Let his ministry prosper. Let his ministry keep touching lives. Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it all. And the church said, 
Amen. On the way out, shake his hand, get you a book, go next door, and get you a chicken leg. <laughs>